Yeah, I guess we'll just get started here. Uh, I guess a lot of people are busy right now, but we'll just record this and then share it online. Um, so today we're going to talk about enterprise blockchain. And then I uh, broke into down to two parts. First, we're going to talk about some of the basics and some definitions and some types of blockchain. And ultimately talk about why enterprise blockchain exists in the first place. And then we'll take a look at some of the real examples that we have today. So first, some of the basics. Uh, I took some definition um, online. And then enterprise blockchain is basically a, a project or undertaking that's especially difficult and risky. So for the purposes of this lecture, you can just think of it as a company or a, a business or a organization, things like that. Um, I just, hopefully you know what blockchain is at this point, but I just thought that to throw the definition here for those who are unfamiliar. And enterprise blockchain is basically, uh, well, some people call it this distributed ledger technology because some argue that it's not actually real blockchain since it's not entirely open to everyone um, to use and join. So they just say, well, let's call it distributed ledger technology then. But they're basically the same thing. And it's usually permission blockchain. So it operates based on private members. And there are two types of permission blockchain. One is federated or um, the other one is private. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about um, the difference between permissionless and being permission. So permission is where anyone can join and you have the, all the rights to use the blockchain, basically. So things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're permissionless blockchain. And then on the other side, there's permissioned blockchain. So if you want to join the network, you have to meet um, some requirements um, for you to enter the blockchain. And there are mainly two ways for the permission blockchain. So you either pre-verify the users so, and then and then allow them to join the blockchain. So have to sign up and create an account or something like that. And then the other one is you can allow anyone to join, but only a couple um, trusted identities that you allow are able to verify transactions on the blockchain. And so the difference between private and federated, or some people call it consortium um, blockchain. So private is basically, you can think of it as controlled by one party. Um, it's different from the centralized system in that it's more decentralized, a little bit more, but it's quite familiar uh, with that. Um, and then on the other side, federated is just like private, but instead of having one party, taking control of the whole thing, you have multiple um, that's able to negotiate and reach a certain consensus. So if you look at this graph here, you can see from the ownership um, row, you can see the private is single identity. Consortium is multiple entities. And one of the questions that um, I think you need to ask is, do people really want decentralization? Um, so right now, people still tend to use centralized system, even in systems that are meant to be decentralized. So crypto uh, exchanges like Mt. Gox or Coinbase, they're um, exchanging Bitcoins, but they're essentially the centralized system on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, the benefit to that is you don't have to remember your own private key. And then some other benefit of centralized system is you can reset the password if you forget it. Um, and then, of course, you get a faster payment system um, in some cases. So also, then why should we use blockchain? Well, there's a couple of reasons here. The first one is you can reduce the, the cost of trust. So you don't have to trust um, a certain person or a certain group of people um, that much. And then the second one is you're able to have kind of like a secure um, transaction between just you and the, the party. You don't have to have a third party involved. So no middleman, nobody like Uber or PayPal, which they usually take a cut, a huge cut of the value being transferred. 
Um, that's one of the reasons they're unicorn companies, but you also introduce transparency um, in the process of keeping data, record keeping, and then you're able to tolerate localized shutdowns or attacks. Um, some of the challenges that blockchain face, uh, speed and efficiency. So Bitcoin right now is about, you, they could do seven to eight transactions per second. Ethereum a little bit better, um, around 20 transactions per second. But then if you look at Visa, they're able to do 24,000, close to 24,000 transactions per second. So there's really no comparison here. Um, some other challenges are, it takes a lot of energy, especially for Bitcoin, using uh, proof of work, a uh, consistent mechanism. Um, so the conclusion is basically that if you want a high volume system or a low latency system, it's still better to be more centralized than completely decentralized. So if you look at the graph here, Visa all the way have 24,000 for Bitcoin, all the way back have seven um, transactions. And one of the things that I want to talk about um, that's related to the technical challenges, this thing called scalability trilemma. It's described by Ethereum Vitalik. Um, he's a, one of the co-founders of Ethereum, and he says that for a blockchain system, um, uh, you, there are three things that you want to try to maximize, right? So security, decentralization, and then scalability. And then he said that, unfortunately, you're only able to pick two out of the three properties. So if you want security and decentralization, then you have to sacrifice scalability. If you want decentralization and scalability, then you have to sacrifice security. Or basically mean just pick one side of the triangle on the, on the graph right here, right? Um, some people disagree and think that we can achieve all three over time. Um, and that's too early to tell. Um, they argue that Visa was founded in 1958, so they have a 60 years of head start before the system like Bitcoin or even more for Ethereum to come out. So if you give them more time, they'll be able to figure it out. But it's, it's open debate right now. Here's more um, detail of the three definitions, decentralization, scalability, security, what, what do each of those mean? Um, but let's just say that the trilemma is, is in fact true. And you, you can only pick two out of the three. So obviously we want, for a company, we, we want security, right? So that give us only the choice between decentralization and scalability. So for a company uh, or organization like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they pick decentralization. So they're on from the graph up here, the blue dot, you can see they are on the left side of the triangle. And then interestingly and quite understandably, most companies in the past pick scalability, right? So if you look at SQL, Oracle, over in the Facebook database, they all pick scalability over decentralization. It's more efficient for for the better for them. Um, some of the potential solutions here that people have come up with, something called layer two or sidechain solutions. So shift, shifting um some of the small transaction off chain. So instead of being on the blockchain, you're able to move it down. Um some people to call it on, offline chain. So you're able to settle some of the transaction offline and put it online on the blockchain once it's settled. Um, some, you could use some other consensus protocols um, called proof of stake and many others that does not consume a lot of energy. And then believe it or not, um, permission blockchain is actually one of the ways to solve the scalability problem, um, even though you compromise decentralization. So we're going to talk about some real life applications or examples today. And I broke it down to two parts on um, platform and projects. So for platform is mostly about how you can build like the structure of the platform that you built and then projects is real projects that they use blockchain to achieve a certain purpose. But each of these could be its own lecture. So there's kind of introduction to each one. And I added some resources at the end of the slides if you are interested to do more research on your own. So first, we're going to talk about some platform. Um, so JP Morgan started this thing called Quorum a couple years ago. 
and then it's basically as I said on the website an enterprise focused version of Ethereum so it's built on top of Ethereum they, it's just basically a soft fork of the Ethereum code um, it's open source you can find a code on GitHub so enterprise enterprise focus basically means that is privacy focus and is scalability focus. Um, so, and then use something called, some consensus called raft. Uh, it's basically that you elect an elder and the rest is follower and the elder are able to mine a block and then the follower are able to verify it, and then pick a new leader or something like that. It's meant to you using a permissioned system. Um, and one of the biggest biggest difference between Quorum and Ethereum is that it's, you're able to do both private and public uh, transactions and smart contracts. So only people who are involved in the transaction or smart contracts are able to see the, the data. And just some more of a, for people who know more about Ethereum, the state database is split into private state and then public state. So the network will agree on the public state, but for the private state database will be different since you have different, uh, your own private transaction and smart contracts. So that's one way that they, they did it. Another platform or framework uh, is called, is by this company called R3, called Corda. And well, you can read on the statement here, but they basically initially designed for financial sectors for recording or keeping the, the contracts between uh, financial institutions in sync. So they have recently launched this thing called Quarter Enterprise, which kind of brings the more financial, reduce the financial uh, factors and then put it into a more generalized way of doing enterprise blockchain. So they, what they're trying to do is basically um, in traditional financial institution or any companies really imagine you need to work with some other companies, right? Or work with some customers and there's a lot of paperwork required and you, there's contracts that need to be filled. And most importantly, you have to be keep up to date. So what usually each company do is try to maintain their own ledger record. So they have their own database, but then it's hard to keep all the contract and file up to date with, um, with the the other party and might lead to inconsistency among the data which is pretty bad right and then Corda is basically a distributed ledger system that for recording and processing shared data such as contracts um so there's thing called Corda network so institutional organization help you to join this network and they will they'll be able to transact faster with people on the network. And one of the end state principles on the white paper is that one, uh, the interesting thing is they said the single legal footing. So basically the they said that the contracts on their platform is could be legally used in any dispute. So it has real life effect. And then basically in conclusion is that or that allows people in business or individual to transact privately between legally identifiable counterparties on a single highly scalable network with the freedom to add more application on top of it. Um, there's also this um, company or production studio, software production studio called Consensus. It's um, Ethereum Venture Studio. So they fund companies where they do a couple of things, but it's, this started by this person called Joseph Lubin. He's one of the co-founders of Ethereum as well. And they mainly do three things. So solutions, they do some consulting work. And then they have some labs for as an incubator. So some of the companies on the left you see here are, are from the incubator. And then they also do some sort of academy, um, some online classes and boot camps to learn about building technology on top of Ethereum. One of the, th uh, the two Interesting ones are Mega Mask. So it's a crypto wallet that you can install on Chrome. They're very easy to use. And the other one is Truffle. Uh, they, they, I think they quit the consensus a couple of years ago, but it's basically a, a way for you to interact with 
Ethereum blockchain, an easier way to interact. Um, I th think many people know this, but it's something called um, Hyperledger from the Linux Foundation. It's, uh, it's a, a open source community. And then the goal is to develop enterprise focused software solutions. And so they have many, many projects, um, including something we'll talk about later called Hyper Hyperledger Fabric. There was some big name contributing to this, um, to this community, including IBM, Intel, Consensus, like we said, and they host a lot, a lot of projects. Here's a structure of some of the um, projects that they have. They call this the greenhouse structure, and then they have some distributed ledgers, um, some libraries, some tools, and much more. So I'm going to talk about just a little bit about Hyperledger Fabric was launched back in 2015. And then it was in, initiated by IBM and an organization called Digital Asset. Um, it's quite similar to Quorum in the way that you could do confidential transaction or private transaction on the platform. So you can see a theme here where companies want to do private work on the blockchain. And then there's another interesting thing that it could do is modular architecture. So it enables people to do their own plugin and add things on top of their framework. Um, Ripple, I think many people are familiar with it. Their slogan is, you can see on the website, instantly move money to all corners of the world. They're trying to um, do a payment system that's fast and secure. It's founded by this person called Jed McKillop. If you know him, he's um, the founder of Mt. Gox. Um, there are basically two parts of on the Ripple network, so network users and network members. If you're a user, you're only able to send transactions, but the members, you're able to process and verify transactions and be able to maintain the, the platform. Um, and what's interesting is that some of the Ripple developers have shown that you can make payment just by sending texts. So if you look at the, the image on the right, you could, this person actually um, texts a phone number and says, like, I'm going to send this amount to that address and then it says confirm and then you're done. The transaction is finished, which is really interesting. Um, some of the projects, um, so these projects might not necessarily be building the blockchain, the, the fundamental blockchain framework, but some are, but it's more purpose focused. So they apply the, the framework that we talked about before, or they do some customization to the framework. And then they have something specific in mind that they wanted to achieve. So the first thing I want to talk about is from the United Nations World Food Program. It's very interesting. They call this thing called building blocks. And then it's basically a blockchain for zero hunger. Um, essentially, it's a blockchain-based cash distribution system for people in need, especially refugees. So in the old traditional way, you send the money either directly to them, which is costly and because of the transaction fee um, and then there might be some financial privacy risk when you send the money to someone you have to go through local government and banks and if there's some corruptions or unstable banks then you know the the money that eventually reach the refugee will, will be at a, a fraction of the original price and then so they tested this way of having a blockchain system instead of directly delivering food to them, which is expensive and actually um, skew the local market price. Or they they changed the way instead of doing traditional money transfer, like we talked about, which is slow, costly, and has some risks. Um, by doing this, they're able to save 98% of the transactions fees, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but basically, in more detail, they use something called proof of authority. So basically, a, a consistent mechanism that says only a small selected number of people uh, have the power to val validate transactions and update the ledger. And then the two technology used in the transaction. So what you see is that mo many projects here, they, they not only use blockchain, but they use some additional technology to bring the data into blockchain. So... So you, they use the blockchain and they use something called biometric identity management system, 
they're basically able to identify that the person is who they say they are, and then they be be able to record record that data on the blockchain that so that is immutable, um, for them to to see the data. And in 2019, they're able to send per month three million in cash, U.S. dollar, to over a hundred thousand people across the two refugee camps in Jordan. And they're they have a massive success so far, and they're hopefully to scale up a little bit more in the future. So another thing is this thing by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's called Moja Loop. Uh, I think I pronounced it probably wrong, but it's basically wanted to do a mobile payment system that's blockchain based. So they want to connect um, all the payments providers and banks. On one platform, so it connects all payment opportunity within one ecosystem, and then people are able to send payments um, using their phone to another person um, who's also using a phone. There's another thing um, by the WWF. Um, they're trying to do some supply chain using blockchain, so. Um, they team up with a company called Consensus, like we talked about before, and many other. Um, they're, they're basically trying to use blockchain to track tuna fish. So they do something called R RFID, which is a radio frequency identification, and then QR code. So by doing that, as you see on the graph right here, they're able to just give a QR code for you, and then when you once you scan it, you're able to find where the tuna fish come from. They like to say that a simple scan of tuna packaging using a smartphone app will tell the story of a tuna fish. So you, you know exactly where your food comes from. And then in addition to this, it's actually solved some of the illegal and report, unreported fishing uh, in many areas because each one has to be identifiable. And then, you know, for tuna fish, just to start, um, Supply chain is obviously, um, obviously a huge industry, so they're trying to scale it up to other uh, food products as well. And then another big name in this industry is called IBM Blockchain. So they're, they're doing something called block, Blockchain as a Service. So they actually help develop um, the Hyperledger fabric that we talked about earlier, and then they use it as an underlying framework for many of it. They have this thing called IBM Food Trust, which is a food supply chain, much like the one we talked about with the WWF. Um, it's used by Walmart and many other companies to track where the food comes from. And then they doing something called decentralized decentralized identity solutions. Um, we can look more into it if you want, but I want to focus on something called blockchain for natural disaster. So they have this short film on their website that you can watch called Bonds of Trust. It's basically about um, after the natural disaster, in this case, it was a hurricane. And then people in the area, in addition to cleaning their houses, they have to file and do a lot of paperwork for either local governments or insurance company. And the results were this um, bags and bags of paperwork. And what they try to do is put it on the blockchain so that everyone has the same kind of record and it's up to date, it's immutable, and it'll be much easier for for people to, to do. So it's only 15 minutes if you want to check it out. I have the link down there. Um, so the last one I want to talk about, I think many people know, is from Facebook called Libra. They're trying to do a simple global payment system and financial infrastructure that powers billions of people. So according to some research, I think back in 2017, 1.7 billion adults um, globally are still outside of the financial system and they have no access whatsoever to a traditional bank, even though that 1 billion out of the 1.7 have mobile phone and almost half of a billion have um, internet access. So, but even for people who do have access to banks, People with less money somehow pay more for financial services, right? Um, so Facebook is envisioning a future where people can send money to each other just like using their phone for messaging. Again, the thing that we've seen before, 
it's, it's fast, secure, and most importantly, at a low cost. But for Facebook to do this is important because I think they're in this unique position to having billions of accounts and they're able to have access to people directly. So as a result of that, the blockchain that they try to use has to be scalable to billions and billions of accounts. So they also said that the Libra blockchain will be backed by a reserve called Libra Reserve. Um, it's basically that the digital cryptocurrency on the blockchain will be able to be fully backed by a reserve of real assets. So there's something to that's different from the Bitcoin, which is just by itself is more unidentifiable. Um, there's something called a Libra Association, which governs the whole Libra project. And basically each member is equal a validator node. So they verify transaction and stuff. It's said to be nonprofit. And they also wish to start as a permission, but in the future, they want to change and become permissionless, which is interesting. But currently, Facebook is facing some backlash from U.S. regulator because they worry that it might replace the U.S. dollar. And as a result of that, in the end of 2019, seven of Libra's association member um, dropped out of the association, including big names that. Um, like PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, eBay, and Stripe. Um, and in October 2019, uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg testified in Congress about Libra. So the the aim, the the ultimate goal for for Libra, is a a stable currency built on a secure and stable open source blockchain, and it's backed by a reserve of, of real assets, and governed by an independent association. Um, we have to see where this will go. They initially wanted to start, I think, in J June of 2020, but I think they pushed it back to later November or something. Um, we just have to see how, how this goes. So in some of the conclusions that I have while doing some research on these projects, I think there um, the opportunities can be found where there's inefficiency in the way we record share data before um, blockchain so many paperwork or contracts that need to keep up to date between multiple parties and then where there's middleman or third party that's taking too much of the transfer value or still or sometimes even being dangerous and not trustworthy for you to trust um, and then I think opportunities can be created by changing the way people live in a centralized system that we're so used to and build a decentralized alternative and show people that why it, it is a, a better way. So just a final quote that I like a lot from this film that I shared with you before called Bonds of Trust from IBM. It basically says that people need to talk less about what blockchain technology is and more about what it can do for people. So and that's when the power of it comes out and is understood. Obviously, it's important to know what blockchain is, but ultimately the goal is to build something with it to help people. So yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, I definitely learned a lot from doing some research um, in preparing this presentation. I hope you all learn something as well. If you have any questions, we have a small group of people here, so feel free to ask um, or care or in the WeChat group. And there's obviously more exciting project out there that either I haven't discovered yet or don't have time to cover. I have linked a lot of resources after this slide for you to check out the ones that you're interested in and some that I didn't talk about. But if you find something that you, you are passionate about, interested in, feel free to share in the WeChat group. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening.